Okay. China is using so-called market socialism models in its Silk Road initiatives in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, sending some state-owned enterprises, but mostly private Chinese capitalists abroad, to set up companies engaged in building infrastructure. These capitalists are motivated by profit, not social justice. However, unlike Western imperialist investors who are given free reign to do whatever makes a profit by their countries of origin, the Chinese capitalists are limited by control of the Chinese government, a government whose industries of finance, all the major utilities, commercial and industrial transportation, and oil are state-owned. Therefore, any capitalist enterprise must be compliant with the state, not the other way around. China's so-called market socialism is really a partial ideological retreat resulting from the constant imperialist military threats and economic war against both China and the former USSR. But our movement must recognize the difference in China's engagements with Asia, Africa, and Latin America versus the Western imperialist engagements in those regions. To not do so would only fuel anti-communism and benefit especially U.S. imperialism by hiding the fact that China and the U.S. have irreconcilable differences in relation to which social classes they represent. China's significant investments in Africa since 2000 are a very real threat to imperialism as a whole and to U.S. imperialism most, most acutely. It's not only the hundreds of billions being invested, but the type of investments allowing for the development of infrastructure and a real improvement in the economies of those countries. And any improvement in the economy that affects the living standards of the inhabitants of those countries, allowing the stifling, debilitating, oppressive cloud of extreme poverty to be removed is key to building self-determination and liberation. We know that the development of the working class and productive forces is an important aspect of building socialism. But we also know that building socialism without the Soviet Union to counter violent U.S. imperialist actions capable of enforcing embargoes and sabotaging economies is even more challenging, especially for developing countries who are therefore dependent on capitalist investment. China can't yet make up for the former USSR's limiting of imperialism's attacks on Africa and Latin America, <clears throat> but it seems willing to protect its investments and partnerships with military force, both by supplying military means or funds to, for example, the African Union's military unit, are the placing of Chinese troops in South Sudan to protect the oil pipelines, which had been sabotaged by U.S.-supported rebel forces. Last July, China dispatched troops to set up its first military base overseas in the East African country of Djibouti to establish an outpost capable of keeping an eye on the main U.S. AFRICOM base there. Not to mention China's advances in improving aircraft that can reach speeds of up to Mach 10 defying radar and their quali and a qualitative leaps in the technology of encryption with the potential of defying any NSA surveillance. All of this must keep the monopoly bankers and industrialists who run this country up at night and in a cold sweat. Therefore, the U.S. especially will do everything it can to discredit and vilify China. In reporting on China's role in Africa, bourgeois media scour the con continent of Africa to find the most egregious example of Chinese company injustice in hopes to paint all Chinese relations in Africa with the same brush. They especially like to talk about the Chinese privately owned Column coal mine in Zambia. Although the top four copper mining companies in Zambia are from Canada, Switzerland, and India, and regarding coal and every other type of mining in Zambia, China's companies are in the minority, along with Brazil and South Africa's. In 2000, five, five Chinese brothers asked the government in Zambia to reopen a mine that had been shut down. However, this created a challenge since the mine was not profitable previously due to the low quality of the coal. So, and here comes the problem with capitalist production. When your product is inferior to your competitors, it's impossible to maintain profits to the satisfaction of investors and creditors without cutting wages and safety standards, cutting benefits and increased speed up for higher productivity, in addition to ignoring ecological concerns. The company was cited for severe air pollution and contamination of water sources used by nearby communities. The Mine Workers Union of Zambia complained that the workers were being beaten by bosses and government officials and police were paid off to look the other way. 
So in October 2010, hundreds of miners protested and were met with two Chinese supervisors with guns who began shooting. There were reports that it was a pellet gun that was used, which would explain why no one was killed, but two people were critically injured and 11 miners were wounded. By 2012, the workers were fed up and held another, uh, another protest. This time, a Chinese manager was unintentionally killed. However, no charges were brought against the workers. In February 2012, the government seized the Kola mine. Three years later, in 2015, the Zambian government returned the mine with a warning that it would be taken again if safety and environmental violations arose. Although many looking into Chinese companies in Africa know column, most know very little about the top four Canadian mining companies in Zambia, like First Quantum Minerals. Zambia was unable to fight strong arm tactics from 1980 on by Canada, the IMF, and the World Bank, along with First Quantum Minerals. The denial of economic and essential uh, and, 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 and the denial of economic aid essential for Zambia's survival was threatened. So the country was forced into privatizing its nationalized copper mines in 1990, which companies like First Quantum could buy cheaply. The, co the country was also forced to give a former vice president of the Bank of Canada the role of governor, govern governor of the Bank of Zambia. This guaranteed long-term poverty for Zimbabwean workers, Zambian workers, and the Canadian government reinforced every crooked deal its majority holding company, like companies like First Quantum made in, in Zambia. Now again, consider the situation with the well-publicized Column Coal and its crimes, egregious for sure, but notice the role played by China, China versus Canada, especially considering what I haven't said yet. Instead of demanding no action against the anti-worker crimes of the company, the Chinese government welcomed the nationalization of the company by Zambia. And the Chinese government ordered Column to pay thousands of dollars each to, to the injured, injured workers who had been shot, and then forced the owners to make a public apology to the entire workforce at the mine and other mines in Zambia. The Canadian government and First Quantum Minerals, on the other hand, set up a systemic guarantee of poverty in Zambia. Yet no major headlines vilifying Canada or their company can be found. Colonial or imperialist relationships are about the politically and economically controlling of a country to steal its resources and deny its ability to develop independently. It also requires a military force. The chauvinism and even different forms of exploitation by some private Chinese companies toward their workers in Africa does not automatically mean colonialism without the ingredients mentioned especially if it does not continue and create the, two minutes, and create the uh, underdevelopment that African scholar Walter Rodney exposed in 1968 with his groundbreaking and authoritative book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. He writes, in the first place, the wealthy created by African labor, the wealth created by African labor and from African resources was grabbed by the capitalist countries in Europe. And in the second place, restrictions were placed upon African capacity to make the maximum use of its economic potential, which is what development is all about. On the other hand, the US military moves in Africa since 2008 are definitely part of their neo-colonial plans, but also threaten naked colonialism. In a 2015 Black Agenda report, Nick Terse, writer for Tom Dispatch, writes, in remote locales, behind fences and beyond the gaze of prying eyes, the US military has built an extensive ar archipelago of African outposts transforming the continent, experts say, into a, la a laboratory for a new kind of war. China's engagement is of a different nature. For example, Zimbabwe Herald reporter Lovemore Chakoba wrote regarding the 2015 and 2016 loan packages negotiated with China and Zimbabwe that they included $5 billion, for, five billion of free aid and interest-free loans China would also train 200,000 technical personnel and provide 40,000 training opportunities for African personnel in China. Uh, in addition to agricultural technological expertise and machinery and training and teams of ag agricultural experts to Zimbabwe were priori prioritized in that aid. And as Walter Rodney pointed out in his book, increasing techno technology in agriculture is one of the most essential prere prerequisites for development in Africa. 
I spent a few weeks combined uh, in Sudan and in Egypt, giving, giving me a glimpse of the vast need, especially in Sudan. For example, in Sudan, I saw an area for, re for refugees that was many acres wide and long as far as I could see. Families were living in mud huts in over 110 degree weather with no fan, no air conditioner, no electricity and hospitals, no stores in sight. That brings to mind the times when Maggie and I were worried about our son as a toddler when he got a fever. Well, panic time for all, all new parents. But I could easily go to the corner store and get an ibuprofen, a thermometer, to take his temperature, our Pedialyte. That was easy for us, and we didn't have to worry about U.S. drones flying overhead. Not so for many in Africa. This is just to remind us that when we're talking about development, we're not talking about getting the latest consumer goods, our trendy stuff, or incorporating a Western lifestyle. We're talking about attaining the basics for survival. Basics whose denial, as Walter Rodney illuminated, was not a lifestyle choice of African people, but a derailment of their natural prog um, progress by European colonialism. And by clarifying the character of China's intervention in Africa, contradictions and all, we can help e echo and be in solidarity with those voices in Africa representing the genuine people's movements on the continent who are determined to rise no more enthralled.